Do you mind introducing yourselves, saying what you do on the show? I'm Rollin Jones. I'm a writer, you know, in charge of writing the show, all that <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Uh, this is Mark Johnson. I'm one of the executive producers. And the man who spoke before me just now, Rollin Jones, created this show. And all of us are in his debt and servitude. Uh, Mark and Rollin, thank you so much for joining me. I have to tell you, I have not been all in on a show in so many years, okay? I have not felt this alive. I haven't felt this electric in years. So thank you for giving me and my husband something to hold on to. <laughs> Keep the love fresh. You took a wildly popular piece of intellectual property. You made it fresh and new. But now, you know you got to do a season two. How are you both feeling? Is there pressure? Is there a sense of, okay, we did the first one. Now we can really dig in. Uh, Yeah, so I'm actually... Just turning the corner about being excited about season two and not being scared <laughs> out of my mind about it. Because it's, cha- <laughs> it's challenging, right? The, the the second half of the interview with the vampire, there's some really lovely passages, but it's a lot of people sitting down and talking. It's a whole new period, a whole new continent, but it's, it's characters who Roland has already created. So I'm feeling actually quite confident and excited and, and just, you know— a buzz about what we're going to do next season. Mark, let's talk about you, honey, because you are just out here with a resume. You've been the executive producer on a lot of AMC shows, including, oh, I don't know, Breaking Bad. Oh, I don't know, Rectify. Oh, I don't know, Better Call Saul. Okay? (laughs) But those are very different, obviously, from the Anne Rice universe. So I'm very curious about what attracted you to the genre of vampires, to the world of Anne Rice, that made you say, get me on board. It's a good question because I was not familiar with Anne Rice to begin with. Mm -hmm. And uh, my excitement, quite frankly, came from what Roland did with this. I read the first, his first script for the pilot. And I thought, oh, my God, this is extraordinary. And read Anne Rice. And I realized all of the treasures that were in there and what Mm -hmm. Roland was taking advantage of and what needed some sort of redressing Mm -hmm. he was doing. Mm -hmm. Roland, can you explain to me this Mm. process? You know, how did you pitch yourself as the showrunner of this? Mm. Um, I came back to the loving arms of AMC. I'd done um, some work with them before, and there were a lot of really savvy executives. I had a big overall meeting here at 19 Things I Want to Do for You Guys. Talk, 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 talk. As I'm leaving the door, one of them goes, you know, we forgot to mention uh, our bosses bought the Anne Rice books. And I stopped... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I put everything down, sat back down and said, we're going to take another 45 minutes for this meeting. And by the by the time <laughs> I walked out, I kind of knew that's what I was going to do. Okay. Um, and, and then they, they put me through a gauntlet of things to prove that I was the guy. And it wasn't just about, oh, what's a good pilot story? What's a good first season? It was, what does this thing look like eight years from now? Okay. Did you ever, ever have any misgivings, any doubt? No, I, I was just excited because I thought I really wanted to do something grand and big. So I have like a little tiny little QB production company, and I had a bunch of my uh, my theater pals sort of build a visual world, a costume world. We just I said, let's build it like a little Ang Lee thing. Let's try to know everything we can about it before we go in. So the more people you had around and the more collaborative it got, um, the more it felt battle tested. Mm-hmm. Look. Let's talk about Louis being black. I'm obsessed because, but let me tell you why though. Let me tell you what I really enjoy about it is because I feel as though we are in this age of adaptations and reboots where there will be a gender swap or a change in race. And that is kind of the extent of it. Meaning we made that change. Look what we did. Isn't that fresh and new and hip? And it felt as though in making this change, you got more story. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Like you were able to mine that fact four more story points and more of a dyna- like a new dynamic in this relationship you know and you're both you know i'm sitting here with you you know for the listener these two men are famously white okay <laughs> famously aggressively white alabaster kings before me and i'm wondering about you know the choice to do that mm-hmm. and what it was to execute it I kind of came around to his ethnicity through a very weird way, which is through Lestat. So there's a very famous sort of rewrite of Lestat, starting with book two. He's an aggressively mm-hmm. different character than he was in book one. and that, that, But that's the Lestat that she carried on for the rest of time. And I was like, mm-hmm. okay, that should be Lestat. Mm-hmm. And so we tried to take the given circumstances that are set with Lestat 
and put him back into this time period. And so he had this sort of super emo relationship with this guy named Nikki. And then he had a very uh, excitable relationship with his mother as his second (laughs) companion choice. Um, And Uh get into that season three, (laughs) y'all. And then I was like, let's give Lestat a legitimate third Mm -hmm. attempt at trying to figure out how to be with somebody for the rest of his life. And how do you not repeat your mistakes? Mm. So I started from there. And I I wanted somebody who had some money because I think he wanted to be, you know, with his with his own folks there. Mm -hmm. And I think he wanted someone I thought who could fight back and who could be a challenge and who would force him to restrain himself. And nobody at AFC was, was really interested in seven seasons of the regretful plantation owner. So, you know, (laughs) even with that though, you wanted to have some connective threads to the novel. So we made Louis come from a a lineage that once did own a plantation, did own slaves. The other thing was sort of aesthetic. If you were going to take away this sort of the ruffled shirts and all the swampy goodness, and you wanted to make this, oh, okay, something new. What's the next hot time that had a a sense of smell and taste and sound? Bertha Jazz seemed pretty, pretty right on. And it just so happened there was a spot at, at that historical time where a black man could get in on some business and still have the sort of morally gray thing that owning a plantation would. And I don't know, it all actually clicked into place pretty quickly. That's so cool. You know, as you said, it makes sense. It feels like you followed the logic, so to speak. The other thing you're trying to do, Naomi, is trying to build as much inherent conflict, enough to not burn through in a season. You want seven or eight years of conflict and uh, distress and vulnerability in both of them. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to load up Louis with as many contradictions and as many unsettled things inside him as possible. Now, how do you decide when you deviate from man's book? Mm. Are there any rules when it comes to what you can invent and when you need to stick to the original? Were you in the writer's room being like, WWARD, what would Anne Rice do? Yeah, that was big. Really? That was essential. There were a couple of caveats make it here and now, make it grand and big. Mm-hmm. But we said, you know, look, she w- she wrote a very transgressive, groundbreaking novel in 1973 and try to put her in the room where she was tasked in 2021 with making a TV show out of this. Mm-hmm. And you want it, there's no reason to do something if you're going to just run, you know, roughshod over it. So you're constantly, constantly revisiting the book. Mm-hmm. And that's not only in the room when you're building story, but that's when you're in draft, that's when you're after production draft, that's when you're last minute, like little things... And you find some things that you had passed over, you didn't think were relevant, like I'm screaming back at you and dropping in as much Anne as we could. And that we were going to write this sort of heightened language that is in the novel. We're going to make our actors talk like that. She is our safety net all the time. That makes sense. Obviously, viewers are in love with Jacob and Sam. People are tweeting me photos of them eating ice cream. We call ourselves hashtag ice cream high. (laughs) The fandom is strong. Can you tell me about how you found Jacob and Sam and the process of deciding they were Louis and Lestat? Well, obviously, nine billion people audition. Kind of get down to like 10 actors that you like on both sides. The simple math of it is the second those two got into their Zoom rooms together, It was very clear something very dynamic was happening. On Jacob's side, you know, right, it's this sort of genuine warmth, kindness, humanity. Like you were like, okay, for for a character who's going to make a number of questionable choices, how do you make them want to love him? And on Sam, I saw his face and I said, no fucking way. No (laughs) fucking way, that guy. This chiseled, stupid, chiseled, (laughs) you know, and his his locks and his dreamy eyes. I was like, no, 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 no. And then I press play, <laughs> and uh, and he he really knew how big we were gonna go. It was wildly specific and subtle. It was it was in his voice, right? There was something a little Jeff Bridges Starman about it <laughs> that I was like, oh, this guy feels like an alien, and he feels other than us. Mm-hmm. They both won the audition. That's basically what happened. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Although I'll tell you, here's a dirty secret. Ready ready for this, uh-huh. Sam bought this piece of technology that you can do a push-in close-up <laughs> right when the seed is getting a little juicy. And I just started laughing my ass off. I was like, oh my God, this guy wants this so hard. <laughs> but you were you called me at the first time you had seen Sam, and you were just so excited about the potential of this guy. And you basically said, he's going to be next to impossible to beat. 
And sure enough, he, nobody uh, nobody could really touch him. But you, from the very first time you uh, you saw his audition, you were pretty convinced that we had our list on. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about this finale. Now, did you always know that that's how the season would end? With the reveal of Armand and the murder of Lestat. Murder in quotes. Hey, Mark, should I open it up? You bet. Let them know. (laughs) Yeah, okay. Here you go. Naomi, very early on, when we're talking about making this thing, and we're in the writer's room and we're in pre-production, a very exciting thing happened. A lot of this had to do with uh, lumber, the cost of lumber, and COVID. Um, (laughs) And we were writing scripts for the entire book, the whole enchilada. And there was this kind of like just lovely call that came from AMC and it's like, hey guys, let me ask you a question. Is there enough story in the first half of this book to stay in New Orleans for a season? And, you know, my first thing was... (laughs) He did put up a real fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because fuck it, man. Are you kidding me? Ah! (laughs) Um, So what we ended up doing was taking what was the first four... And turning them into the first seven. <gasps> I know, right? <laughs> and Naomi, we did that 50 days before we shot our, our, our first day. Oh, my God. My stomach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My stomach. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot. Because, like, out there, folks, it's not that you can, like, hey, let's slide in something in between two. And you literally, every every break suddenly just changes. And it was, I think, to the benefit of the show. Mm. I think we made a better product because – of the price of lumber and cobra, because I think we were staring at the fact that we were not going to be able to do Europe in the same beautiful, detailed way that we were doing New Orleans. Mm. So suddenly a thing that I thought was probably, I think in my original pitch, 10 episodes, what we were aiming for was eight, is now a 15-episode mm. book. Oh, okay. Was that the ending of my season one? It wasn't originally, but it, it became the ending. And, and right now it's impossible for me, anyhow, to imagine – the, how we would have packed all of that into uh, one season. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. It feels natural. I mean, it doesn't feel rushed. Everything feels really earned. And there, there's such a movement to that finale, right? Meaning all that planning and everything happening and kind of like Claudia becoming this mastermind. For me personally, that kind of episode, it's one for the people. You know, it's one for everybody else. <laughs> um, because, you know, you're doing twists and turns and you're you're, you're kind of doing it like a thriller you know, my favorite scene in there is probably the one that stops action cold, which is the balcony scene. Mm. That monologue that Lestat has where he's, you know, essentially saying one more time, even though at that point he knows they're plotting to kill him, I love you, Louis. It's all from Anne's novel talking about her love of New Orleans. He's talking about New Orleans in words, but he's saying that, that's you, Louis. I'm going to miss this. I'm going to miss all these moments that we had Mm -hmm. together. And thinking that this is all from Louis's memory, looking back on that moment with Lestat, it's like even more gutting. Memory is a very, very huge part of this show. Right. The tagline for this show should be memory is a monster. Mm-hmm. We're only on episode seven of 15. You only know half of it, maybe. Mm, okay, okay. Now, let's listen to a few questions from the fans because people are calling in. Okay. They've got emotions. They've got questions. And I think you guys need to hear them. Hello, I am calling from sunny Southern California, which is like the worst place for a vampire to live. Um, But I have a question, and I want to know, how sympathetic do you think Lestat is? Because obviously, this man has some major flaws. But, you know, like the whole next book after Interview with a Vampire is a whole lot of backpedaling of Lestat's character being like, he's not so bad, he's not so bad. Spoilers for like a 30-year-old book, I guess. Anyway... How sympathetic do you think he truly is? And how much do you want to show that? Hmm. Okay. Okay. These listeners are reading as well. Okay. These people are taking a two-pronged approach. Right, 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 right. It's a good question. You know what, Naomi? Here's something that was really, really exciting and fascinating. When you have a show of seven episodes, we had four editors on this one. And it was so great to watch almost every single one of them initially go, boy, I really love that Louis. Oh, that was not. What a prick. And then... As they were coming around, literally the same editor in the same episode going, I'm beginning to see it from Lestat's point of view. <laughs> like, um, And the more you spend time with it, I find Lestat wildly sympathetic. And the way it's built, you're not going to see Lestat speaking for himself until season three. Wow. It's a big deal, right? You go ahead and have somebody else 
tell the world about you from their point of view. <laughs> if I had to line them up and say who had the most traumatic entrance into this world as a vampire, it's Lestat. You have no idea the baggage that he is carrying in into North America. Yeah. We are playing with point of view and uh, stick with Lestat. He's got a lot of pain, folks. Okay. I think we've got another voicemail. Let's listen. So I absolutely love this show. Why is Louis truly doing this interview? From the beginning, throughout the whole series, he says, I want to redo. I want to give you the true story. I've changed, but yet he's still doing the same thing. He's dodging questions. He's being cagey. If so many things were off the table, then why did you bring this man all the way to Dubai to redo this? He could have stayed at home and lived his life and passed on. You brought him here, Louie. You did. Okay. I love, love the series, but that was a burning question for me. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about Malloy and Louie in this dynamic. As you said, you know, memory. Memory is a monster. Yep. So what is Louie doing this interview for? It is absolutely the question. If you want to know um, what we're still, you know, digging out of, it is it is the why of it, right? Yeah. There's a real reason why this is the second interview. And the first interview is super important. Mm-hmm. Ha, ha, ha. Tune in season two. <laughs> and I will just say this. These two have been brought together because something very significant happened, life-altering happened to them in 1973. Mm -hmm. And they didn't get it right. And they weren't the right people at the time to do it. And now they think they are. And yet, like all of us, you still don't know who you are. Uh, and you still got to go deeper. But that just means there is a lot of meat, not only on Louis' side, but on Malloy's side. And most importantly, Armand's side, mm -hmm. who has become for us the single most fascinating character of season two. Oh my God. Yeah, there's a lot in Dubai that's yet to be revealed. Ooh, okay, this is juicy, but we have to keep going. Let's listen to our next listener question. Hey, this is Michael. I am a queer vampire aficionado. I grew up on the Anne Rice novels my grandmother passed to me when I was in middle school, as inappropriate or appropriate as that may be. And now that there's this queer angle so explicit in the series. I'm so excited that I get to see a little bit more of that. But my question is, do we think that we've seen the end of Louis and Lestat's sex capades, sex life, and all the good steamy stuff? You know, are we looking forward to seeing a bit more of that hot, steamy, gay, awesome vampire loving? Anyway, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. So, it's AMC. We are trying to slide as much under the door as we possibly can. And we're really interested in the whole thing. The, the hotness, sure, but the dynamics and the love story and the ups and downs and the psychological torment and the, all, all of that stuff. If it's a love story, we're trying to write one that doesn't disappear after book one. But yeah, I mean, sure, you'll get some. It'll be there. <laughs> I mean, Armand's coming, folks. Eh, you know, um, and Lestat is a... A uh, very fluid fella. Mm -hmm. There's a whole sea of stuff that's coming ahead. It should look like the sexual or history of the world. <laughs> There'll be something in it for everybody. <laughs> okay, we have another, we have one more, one last hard hitting question from the listeners. Hey, okay, so I'm watching Interview with the Vampire for the 50,000th time. I'm sitting up here thinking to myself, can a can a vampire like can he lose weight? Can he gain weight? Like can a vampire go to the gym and pump up? Like I mean their their diet obviously is blood, but you know did you did you get some omega threes in your blood and, and it pumped you up? Like obviously when you become a vampire, whatever you look like then that's what you're gonna look like for eternity. Like if you got crossy lines, you crossy lines for eternity. Like if if Louis bites Malloy, Malloy gonna be that old ass man. For eternity. Like, he ain't gonna go back to young Malloy. Keep doing what you're doing. It's my Sunday obsession. Have a great day. <laughs> oh, you know, you sit on all these these things forever, and you edit them down, edit them down, and you never want to see them again. Whoever that woman is, 
if she want if she was sitting next to me, I would rewatch all these shows. I really would. That <laughs> that is who I would want to watch this show with. You're the best. I know. We're gonna start tweeting at each other. I'm sure. Our listeners are incredible, and these are some wonderful questions. So thank you all for calling in. Now, I know I have to let you both go soon, but first, can we talk a little bit about what's to come? <laughs> you had hinted that you're thinking this show can go on for many seasons, but how long exactly are you thinking? Listen to this. The real reason why I wanted to do this show, season three. Ooh-hoo! The Vampire Lestat. Oh, I really know how I want to do The Vampire Lestat, and I couldn't be more excited about it. I think as goofy as body switching is, and we'll come up with some elegant way, I think there's something in the, the tale of the body thief. Queen of the Dam is going to be a, you know, I'm going to think on that uh-huh. one. How to do Queen <laughs> of the Dam is just such a massive object. Whether that's one or two seasons, who knows? Mm-hmm. I'm in it for the long haul. I, you know, I'm following Roland wherever he's going. You know, I'm involved, thanks to AMC, in a number of Anne Rice projects. We also have uh, Mayfair Witches and, a, yes. and other things that Roland and I are executive producing Ooh. that are going to come from her works. So it's a long-term commitment, which I'm really happy about. And honestly, three years ago, I wouldn't have known. Her characters are so incredibly relatable, and they are we. You know, they're no, they're no difference, except maybe they have a couple of little uh, habits that we don't have. But they're lonely, they want love, they want to belong, and that's why she's so en- enduring. Right, right. Well, speaking of Mayfair Witches, I'm actually going to be talking to Alexandra Daddario later on in this episode. And Mark, you do have this access in working on all these shows, seeing these bigger pictures. How do you see each individual show existing in this Anne Rice universe that AMC is creating? Do you think if you loved Interview with the Vampires, you will love Mayfair Witches? Do you think it's filling, attracting a different audience or filling in a gap? It's interesting. No, not necessarily, because they're all so completely different. If you pay a close attention, you'll realize who they came from. They came from the same person, the same woman whose concentration, stylistic, thematic, are very much the same. But Mayfair Witches is not Interview with a Vampire. And yet, uh, I want to believe, I believe it's every bit as satisfying and it won't necessarily have the exact same audience. But that's that's really kind of wonderful. And that's the way we're approaching the future. She has given us this wonderful um, sandbox in which to play and we're going we're gonna to be in there for some time. <laughs> Sometimes, strap in. <laughs> You've got a decade at least. <laughs> Right. In the world of Anne Rice. Okay, both of you. So you better be ready. Let me just say one last thing, because um, th- this is new to me. I never, I had never been to Comic-Con before, uh-huh. and I was quite surprised and quite taken aback and shockingly moved by the sincerity and authenticity of fandom. It, it reminded me of how I have felt about certain things, and it's been really, really cool, the level of intensity and love, and really appreciate all the love and patience and open-heartedness y'all out there have have taken for the show we all love it the same way oh my goodness my heart is warm what you have done so far is amazing and i want to thank you guys so much for a wonderful season of television the new season that is to come and for taking the time to chat with me today thank you so much thank you naomi 